We'll call the meeting to order. First order of business is approval of the agenda. Does anyone want to make any edits to the agenda, move anything around? Okay, hearing none, I'll deem it approved. Comments from the chair. So, I hope you all reapplied for planning commission. Yeah. I understand that the city council will be making the appointments Wednesday, this Wednesday, oh, this, yes. week. this week, um, and their meeting starts at 6.25 now, I believe. I can check that. It's, it's on the Instead website. Instead of 6.30? Maybe 6.35? I remember there was a 5. Oh, a 5 in there. Oh. But, uh, yeah. I, so sure. I, and it used to, it's, I think it's changed, so I just take a look at the website. Um, I don't know where it is on the agenda. I haven't looked at it, but... Um, I think we're right after the consent agenda, so okay. it should be near the beginning. Yeah, so oh, goodness. Yeah. I encourage people to attend and just be there, be present, and explain why you want to continue. And so there, if you're asked. they will be breaking <laughs> us up into different terms, or we'll, yes, right. So My understanding is it was basically an administrative cleanup yeah. because of the way we had kind of a stacked appointment term with I think five of us were five or four of us were all needing to get reappointed in one fell swoop on one date in August and then you had a random date and then I think these two have a different date the, the so issue that came up with the, yeah, it the, the yeah. issue that came up with the previous is that we are under the charter and the charter when it, the way it was worded, appoints everyone for a two-year term. Yeah. So it changed. It's even if somebody inside. leaves and then gets a new person gets appointed to replace that, you're not filling the seat. You get a two-year appointment. So mm -hmm. yeah, staggered all over. Yeah. Yes. So this person might be. So it's just to clean on the all the stuff. And that one and might the be on the 20th. Charter language is different now, and yeah. it has. So now it'll of, be seats. Term, yeah, terms of two years, and they'll be staggered. And so to kick off, some people will be appointed to a three-year term. Some will be two years. But after that three-year term is up, those people will be on two-year term going forward. Some are one year. Is that is it two and one year? And then it'll be... I knew it was going to be... Yeah, so maybe it's two and one year and then two years going forward. But, um, yeah, so that's the... That's the idea behind that. So I just want to remind everyone to attend the council meeting if we can. Because you never know. Well, you I might be contesting your seat without even <laughs> knowing. So um, that's that's the only item I had to, to talk about that was not on the agenda. Um, so that's item three. Item four is general business. We don't have any members of the public here, so the general business, which is generally any items from the public that aren't already on the agenda, it, it's kind of silly because it's moved. So we'll move on to item five, which is Mike's topic to approve the municipal planning grant application topic for 2019. Okay, so I don't think we have to spend a lot of time on it. I did give you a copy of the of the municipal planning grant FY19. As far as I have it done, I still have more to do. Um, but if you're interested, you can read through it and provide comments. If you are um, interested, it is due next Monday. So this will be approved by council on Wednesday. The topic, which is I can read it officially out of here. It's a streetscape master plan for State Street Montpelier, and the City of Montpelier will use these funds to hire a consultant to develop a streetscape master plan for State Street from Main Street to Taylor. So the idea of this is I've done a number of these when I was in Barry City, and they work very well as a first step for doing these downtown improvements because the public gets a chance to really start looking at um, what changes we want to make. We picked State Street because there is a plan in either 2021, I think, 2021, 2022, to replace the Rialto Bridge. 
So we're already going to be shutting down part of State Street. And can we take this as an opportunity if we want to move curb lines, um, if we want to put in more extensive stormwater treatment or something else, that would be the, the best opportunity to get in because the street's already going to be shut down. Um, but if we take the opportunity this year to kind of lay out where would we like to see trees, where would we like to see crosswalks, would we like to see bumped out crosswalks in the same way you'd see in Barry City? Bike lanes. Bike basically. lanes, if you want bike lanes. I mean, really, that's where the, 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 the discussion would come up. If we, if we build a parking garage, how much on-street parking do we need? Are there places and opportunities to remove on-street parking so we could make safer bike lanes? But I think this this is where you really have those conversations, is in that master plan to look at what would things look like when we're done um, and lay it out. And then we can start working on the next step, which would be the preparation. Um, so we plan, prepare, implement. So this would be the planning step, the preparing. This, the DPW and the planning department would start working on grants and how could we help pay for various pieces of the project. And then hopefully when we're ready to implement the Rialto Bridge project, we can implement the streetscape improvement as well. Mike, is that the section of State Street that you said does not have separated storm and sand area? There's it further down. There is a separated storm system coming down East State right. that doesn't have an outlet. So when it reaches the intersection, my understanding is it is recombined because it doesn't have an outlet. So with the Rialto Bridge project, one option would also be to continue the underground work to complete that disconnection process. Oh, the separation is on State Street. It's just not on East State. I it's mean, on it, East it, State, but it's not on it. State. Oh, we'd have to state. connect it through. But we're doing the bridge. The reason why we'd have to core the bridge foundation, well, if we're replacing the bridge, we can Okay, take so care all of that it. could get integrated in the same Yeah, and project. I DPW is taking care of that. But if we're already there putting in a storm sewer pipe, could we put in trees, tree boxes, that we could do infiltration on with piping the, basically, the overflow so you'd infiltrate as much when infiltration, when you get too much water in it, then it would overflow to the CSO. Um, well, to the separated uh, storm system. So, but that's, those details would get worked out in the engineering steps, but the first question is. But it's part of the, the overall scope. It would be part of the overall scope of all the pictures and all the things we want to see. Who is the proposed grantor of the state? Uh, these are state funds. Municipal planning grant are state funds. They originate from the property transfer tax. How much are you asking for? 21000 It'll be a $23,000 project. 21000 would be covered by the grant. So a city has a matching? The city has a match. Yeah, it's a, it's a required minimum 10% match. We'll actually be paying a little more than 10%. This would hire a consultant, yeah. Yeah. And they'd be working with a complete streets group, I assume? Yep. Uh, we've targeted a number of different groups that would be worked that they would work with. Uh, this is actually has received a lot of support from Montpelier Live and the Montpelier Development Corp. Um, the other timeliness of this is a lot of communities. Um, wasn't true for Barry City, but was true for St. Albans. A lot of these streetscape improvements get paid for out of TIF funds. And now that we were approved for the TIF project, we could use some TIF funds if there's funds available. It would need its own bond vote and its own Sounds, yeah. process, but. And is the scope such that we can get a master plan for $20,000? Uh, I contacted uh, Greenman Peterson. Um, Carolyn Radich, who used to be with ORW with Bob White, they've done these projects. Um, they did a couple of, they, they did Greening America's Capitals for Montpelier. They did two projects in Barry City for me. Um, the two in Barry City were both for around $20,000. They helped with the work plan and they came up with the cost estimates. So we think it's a fairly good number. 
because it's a smaller street segment, we would really love to do state and main, but there just isn't the budget to do state and main. So we'll do State Street now and then follow up with maybe Main Street as next year's grant or something like that. So eventually we'll have all these pieces that'll tie together to Berry Street and the, you know. We would, yeah, that reading. would be my vision would be to have you know, a, a true master plan for the downtown so we can really start to lay out and kind of improve the downtown streetscape. So how, how does the current plan for the bike, uh, the bike path and, and that the site where m and Beverage was, how does that all tie into all of the various plans that we have? Um, is it is it adopted plan? The streetscape plan? No. Well, there's the, there was the Greening Americas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which which focused on Berry Street and that intersection, right? Yep. So is that part of an accepted and adopted plan? It, the Greening Americas Capitals laid out a bunch of ideas that the city could look at. So we didn't. We didn't give them an assignment as much as it was identify areas where, we, where the city has opportunities and they went out and found opportunities and said, Taylor Street has a lot of opportunities, here's what you can do there. Um, Barry has opportunities, here's what you can do there. And put those, those out. So those are being further studied. So we do have a Main Street scoping study that's right. looking at do we put roundabouts? Do we put street lights? Do we put, and we'll have those results, which we can then give to whoever does State Street to go through and say, we're putting in this, we're keeping this stoplight at State Main. So you've got to design with that in mind. Or we're going to build in a roundabout here at State Main. You have to build that into whatever design you have for State Street. But in terms of the bike path and what creating a bike path bridge and, and that whole that's all part of the that's, that's all part of the Winooski one. West plan. There was a Winooski West plan twenty years ago. Are you asking how how do all these plans tie together? Yeah. yeah. Well they'll eventually and which ones are actually adopted and which ones are just uh, you know if, um, ideas. Yes. The Winooski the Winooski West plan ended at M M Beverage. Uh -huh. Winooski East started at the rec center and goes out to the ice skating rink. Oops. What we have is the gap in the middle. And that's what Greening America's Capitals, oh, okay. and that's what all these ones, they, they, they've done a number of studies. Each one is trying to go and say, well, let's go to, down Stonecutter's Way. We can't do it. Let's go beside the railroad tracks. You can't do that. Let's go down Berry Street. Well, you can do that, but it's going to remove cars, so how do we make that work? So each one is kind of, we've never made a decision of which answer it's going to be, and I think that's going to, we're going to eventually have to make that decision soon because we're finally building the bike path. Right, so we don't have necessarily, we don't have a connection to the bike path. I, yeah, I yeah. don't think we have defined the answer of exactly how we're connecting those yet. Oh, okay. I think most people assume we're going to eventually put a bike lane on Berry Street, at least down that far. But is it a counter flow both on the same side? Which side? I don't, you know, I think there are still questions that haven't been answered. But that's a transportation question, transportation committee question. So Corey would have that. But once Nowhere that nice. whole prod, the one Taylor Street, the you know the, the bike bridge and everything, is done, we still won't have a continuous bike path. No, the funding that is building the transit center and the funding that's building the bike path starts at Taylor Street and ends at Main Street. Okay, that's All right. what that funding begins and ends. Yeah. Okay. So I wasn't sure about that. That's yep. right. Okay. Thanks. So you mentioned no parking. hook up to the existing bike path? Not Would in the existing mean? funding that we have. I didn't know that. I didn't either. Well, I thought we could have a race down all the way down from the high school. 
So, Mike, what are the chances that par a parking answer is involved in this plan? Street, in state street plan. for the state street plan i think so this would be if this gets approved we would be approved in november we would have funding starting in january and we could start working on it sometime next spring or summer had to have somebody working on this by that time we should have a number of other answers are we building a parking garage yes or no are we what are we doing for our intersections are we doing roundabouts are we doing street lights um so there are going to be a number of these things. Are we building a hotel um, so they can build that? So I think the answer to the question is going to depend on the answer to what's there. If we don't build a hotel and don't build a parking garage, then probably the parking is going to remain, I would imagine. It's a policy decision of council. People can propose to take parking off State Street a recommendation but I doubt it would get a lot of traction if you don't have another place for people to park especially during legislative fewer sports. places for people to park yes. than they do now yeah. but um, I think that'll be a question that the answer to that will be and I think it'll be a public discussion too will this involve the farmers market area is that considered state Heen street Heeny lot um, yes we were thinking well we were thinking slightly bigger. You can't just plan for State Street without looking at what's going on on either side. Mm -hmm. So it may not be getting into the specifics, but um, certainly Carolyn and Bob, who were um, with ORW and now Greenman Peterson, they, they did the Heaney Lot. So they did Berry Street, Heaney Lot, Taylor Street, and then a couple other intersections on Main Street that they came up with ideas for. The ideas that they came up for are the ones that are being studied. So I think what they would, if, it, if they were hired or somebody else were hired, they would go back to the Greening America's Capitals and go and say, we talked about some ideas. Some of them would be eliminated. Um, if we build the parking garage, we can't build the bridge that was proposed in Greening America's Capitals, which was from the intersection of Barry, you'd be able to go over a bridge and then go up Heaney Lot to get back up to Elm Street. And Heaney Lot would be taken over significantly by the parking garage as well. So Yeah, now if there's a parking garage, you can't build a bridge in the road because there's a parking right, garage. Right, the and, and it affects the farmer's market location. So. Yeah. Where's the parking lot in relationship to the Heaney Lot? The parking garage. garage. The parking garage. The parking garage is it starts on the Capitol Plaza parking lot and it goes over the property line and goes over part of the Heaney lot on that back side. Almost to the Heaney lot property line on the Riverside. Yeah. But I didn't, as I said, I, I don't know unless there was a, a large objection. I mean, we've got one more week to go before this is due. They'll, this will be a consent agenda item for approval by the council. If people have changes or tweaks or edits, I'm more than welcome to, to let me know. Otherwise, I'm going to continue working on that. And I will when be... Extra when do you need feedback? Excuse me. Uh, certainly by the end of the week. At some point, I'll need your signature. Okay. Do you have an extra copy of that application? Are we required to approve them? Uh, I think I it's just sign. approving the, to the topic is specifically Municipal Planning Commission recommends applying for this grant. And we'll be part of, we'll be working with the consultants in there if this goes through and yes. this committee will get to work with them. Oh, great, thanks. Along with the oh, which you were looking for a copy? Of that. Yeah. Yeah, that application. So, yeah, this would be working either as a subcommittee of this group or full commission. Well, I need a motion to approve before I can, and a vote before I can sign, at least. I certainly recommend planning. <laughs> it looks like a good idea. Yeah. Is That's that a motion, Cal? Yeah, I'll move that we recommend acceptance of planning. Oh, second. Second. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
second. Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay, motion carries. I will sign. If anyone has any edits to the substance of the application, send them to Mike before the end of the week. Uh, next item of business is to continue review of punch list of zoning fixes. So, Barb, I don't know if you want to talk about reopening the discussion for the ones that we've already gone through. I just want to give you an opportunity. I now. thought you didn't want to do that. So, well, if you want to move to reopen I, the discussion, you are. I will absolutely entertain that. I discussion. have a draft of a memo that I'm going to give a copy to Mike, so we can go over this because I know he's been pretty tied up. So, I guess we could just record that I'm going to give a draft copy of the memo to Mike that we're working on together. Okay. 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 So. The bar okay. It's no. be fair for you to summarize. What I missed the meeting, but I'm pretty sure you told people generally what your concern was. Yeah. But you and I met and spent quite a bit of time looking at, at Mike's the, rebuttal. At the various aspects of it. said yeah. we can handle it by a lot of other Right, things. right. And um, so, so we're talking about. I guess we are going to. Yeah, <laughs> we will. I, I just, I don't want to stymie conversation. I think it's really important to discuss things. I just want to make sure we're using our time efficiently. So that's where I get concerned about this. So we'll, we'll touch on it and then if people want to have a more of a conversation about it, then I'll entertain motions to reopen the vote. Um, we're talking about the question of calculating uh, density based on buildable area and we're talking about um, the removing, the lifting the prohibition on building on steep slopes or slopes of 30% or more. So, as far as I understand, that's the conversation. Right. So, okay, right. But we just um, uh, briefly that the intention of the original intention when we drafted the zoning was to use that tool to control soil erosion um, on the building above 30% slope. And the other piece of it was to use it as a tool to control um, inappropriate development in density in different. Um, zones in different districts because the districts are set up with here's the maximum density that could be built based on lot size number of units per x number of square feet of lot size and uh, that may or may not lead to um, inappropriate development and development that is not keeping with the character of the neighborhood so there were several different aspects that Kim and I discussed uh, about that piece of uh, character of the neighborhood, one of which was visual character, and the other one had to do with the density of the um, residential units in that particular district. So if we're trying, if we want to, I mean, I'm open to finding a new way to, to designate that if we don't want to use slopes. I do want to say that it is possible to have slope calculations uh, without an undue burden on the applicant. So I just want to make sure that, that that's clear because I have looked into that. I've also done some um, some test cases, which I've used be similar to the test cases I used in the past when we were looking at density bonuses. And, um, and my concern is the level of, of potential development that could happen in a particular zone, and the example I used was in Res 6000, where an existing site could potentially be developed into eight units when it's currently a two-family, and it's surrounded by two families, one and two families, actually mostly one family. So I want to make sure that whatever we do, that we are able to, if we don't want to look at it from a steep slope basis, and maybe that's a hat, you know, using a hatchet to to shave a piece of paper that it's not really the appropriate way to do this, but we need then we need to address it more directly with making we making sure that we have um, safeguards in place to make, keep inappropriate levels of development from happening in our neighborhoods, which would 
seriously impact the character. We've already had that happen in a few cases in Montpelier, and I want to make sure that we don't let that happen again. So that's it. So I drafted a memo. I've uh, given a copy to Mike. He hasn't seen it yet, so this is brand new. So um, we can sit down and look at it together. I have no idea if um, what appropriate alternatives we might be able to, to find, but uh, I think we need to find some alternative. Any other comments, Kim? Did I? Only that I admire the depth and thoroughness of your work. It left me behind, but I tried to catch up, and I think it's done a good job, um, and I think it requires more thought. I'd like Mike's input, and then we'll figure out whether to go ahead or not. Yeah, and I haven't had a chance to look through the, she, I, I noted she had a lot of examples that she put in there, and I haven't had a chance to look through them, because some of them may be, it's a duplex. They could put eight units, but if it's a district that doesn't allow multifamily, then you can't put eight units anyways, um, because it would be um, captured that way. So I haven't had a chance to kind of look through and see whether there are any other things that would go and say, well, you couldn't do that anyways. Um, so that example isn't isn't relevant. But I'll, I'll go through, I'm going to try this week to go through um, and try to get caught up on that. That's on your your initial email was on one of my list of things to try to get through after I finished the municipal planning grant application. All right, yeah, because there were three example uh, parcels um, in there, um, two of which. Yeah, and I saw when you sent an email to Kirby, you had a couple other examples in there. I think you had, unless so those were the same ones. No, I had Liberty Street and uh, Sibley Street, okay. yeah, Sibley Ave, and, uh, and then there was one on the corner of Marvin and uh, in college, which is currently undeveloped, that they're looking to subdivide. So we're talking about numbers 26 and 32. And we're talking about this, um, just to put it in context of how we review this and what we, what staff recommended, what we had decided. Um, so, I mean, the question is, does the commission want to reconsider this recommendation for city council um, and have further discussion on it, including coming up with alternative ways to to, to deal with this? I, I like that Barb's now at a place in discussing this where she's talking about tackling it directly mm -hmm. because we feel like, yeah, the, the density and the slope issue were sort of ways to, as like a proxy way or an indirect way to get some of these issues you're concerned so, with. Yeah. So that now that you're talking about maybe there's ways to handle that directly, I, I like hearing that. Uh, I think one course of action could be that we continue with what we're doing with the punch list and uh, have the memo ha and have Barb, if she wants to, discuss it with city council. And if it gains traction with city council, maybe they can ask us to just, in a larger sense, look at what is the best way to directly handle these issues that part is raising as a concern. Yeah, I think we should go through, and then if we have time, or maybe go back and if, once we read what Barb has done, revisit it. But it seems like if we've spent a couple meetings talking about it and voted on it twice now, just keep going. So I'll make a note about 26 and 32 to come back to that discussion. Once we've completed the punch list that we have in front of us, is that what I'm saying? Well, if we can see the memo, that would be helpful. Right. The actual yeah. examples of what, what the implications would be, that would be helpful. It's hard to talk about in the abstract without having seen what's in that. I'm certainly willing to circulate yeah. everything I've done to date um, but I thought it would be better for us to talk about it amongst our amongst the Commission before I took it to council right so once we've seen Sounds it like then talk about it because I, I would prefer that we talk about it too before it goes to the council okay. it's coming All right. from you. yeah absolutely yeah. but I think it would be helpful to see it of course right right and actually have time have the time to talk about it which 
Well, and, you know, it, it became one of those things where I could not send it out to the entire commission without violating the open meeting law because then it's reduced presenting material to everyone outside of the meeting. So I guess what I will do is send it to Mike, and then Mike, you can send it out. I'm not sure that I don't know what the process. Yeah, as long as we're not discussing it, I mean, we can send stuff out. We just can't. Yeah, we'll put it on an agenda and say. And well, so should I send it to you directly now, and then you will send it out? Um, I think you can send it to everyone. I think you can send it to everyone. Oh, it's okay. I thought that I thought that caused some trouble in the past. Well, we can't respond. Okay. Yeah, we can't respond. Where, where, yeah, okay, the response is to start getting people in trouble. All right, so don't <laughs> respond. I'm going to send it to you, but don't respond. Okay, there you <laughs> yeah, go. All right. There you go. Okay. Okay, so I'll I'll flag these two as once we have the memo. And We'll come back and discuss those two. Okay, good. I knew there was a resolution there somewhere. Mm -hmm. We should get you um, Okay, so continuing on from the looks of my chart, it looks like we're on 34. Is that right, Mike? Yes. I'm gonna take it yeah. from here. Uh, so these are these are all green ones. So they're really not things that should be making a big difference. So I don't know if anyone really wants to talk about it. 34, uh, there's inconsistency in how things are discussed. Some things say 30% or more, and some things say more than 30%. It's infinitely small differences, but it should be consistent as to what happens on 30%. So because it's mapped at 30%, I would keep it there. Number 35 is change title to vehicle access and circulation and strike point a bicycle and pedestrian um, this section was initially split into two and part of it was moved to site plane the title has never changed so the heading doesn't match what's actually there so it if bike and pedestrians has already moved to yes. 3202 yep okay Um, so 3011, that whole section is talking about parking. So this point C uh, discusses um, fraction of parking, fractional parking spaces is not discussed, which we should put in there. So if somebody's required to have 3.2 parking spaces, they're actually required to have four parking spaces, but we don't mention that. So we just want, we were just going to recommend adding in a number four that states that fractional spaces will always be rounded up. Can we round it down? It doesn't we can, say that. We can in the make notes? a rule. We can make what a rule, whatever it says. I thought usually. the notes actually noted now that they about how it's rounded. Very small print. <laughs> uh, oh, if it's hiding somewhere, we didn't find it. Okay. <laughs> but we can do whatever we want, John, to answer your question. We just generally every other place I've worked, if you're required to have three point one parking spaces then you have to have four parking spaces. Uh, I, I guess I'll advocate for just rounding down. Instead it's of like rounding below up. Five, just straight like rounding? Three, well, whatever it is. Yeah, to reduce it's just the required right. parking. There's no such thing as like a half space that you're required to have. What is, uh, what is it? That's parking. It's talking about parking. Everywhere? Parking requirements, yeah, generally. Who needs parking spaces? How many parking spaces? What size parking spaces? Can you give us a, a, a common example of how we can end up at 3.5 or 2.5? Uh, especially when it t comes to commercial, you end up needing a parking space per 350 square feet because you've got a 500 square foot something, then you end up at you know 1.75 parking spaces or something. And so we're like. For us, we have to decide, okay, are we requiring them to have two or are we requiring them to have one? And from an administrative standpoint, we don't really care. From a policy standpoint, it makes a difference, you know. Um, but we just need, we should be clear in our rules whether we're, whether we round at 3.5 it goes up, at 3.4 it goes down, do we truncate, so at 3.9 it goes down to 3, do we always round up? Most communities always round up because if, no you matter. Need a, if you need a half a parking space, then you need a whole parking space. If you need point two of a parking space. If you need you point need two of a parking space. You need a whole parking space. And I would say if you need a parking space, 
you can figure that out and decide on your own as opposed to us telling you you need a parking space. Okay. Actually, our notes, the notes under figure 3-13, the minimum parking ratios, the first note says when calculations of minimum parking requirements based on these ratios results in a fractional number, the number of spaces shall be rounded up to the nearest whole number. So it's right, it's under the um, uh, figure. So, well, so we can change yeah, that if there. you want to. Okay. Well, if it is there, then that was one we didn't see it. So we. I don't know. It might have been, you know, generation from the pre. I, I finally have the final draft in here now. So. Which section? Is it? Um, figure it's, three thirteen. Yeah, figure three dash thirteen. Fourteen three twelve. It's oh, I'm sorry. It's on three three twenty six. Okay. Three dash two six. I would still probably go and take it out of notes. I mean, it really, it, it becomes very difficult for us to, when we're writing a staff report, yeah. to note a note. Note a note, That's especially it, if it doesn't it, have a designation. It's a lot easier for us if it's in the actual language. Yeah. So mm -hmm. we. Because the rest of that is, seems to be definitions. All right, so I actually did not see that. All right. Um, Number. John, are you making a motion? Sure, I'll to move to it. round it down. <laughs> I'll second that. Any further discussion on this? All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. Okay, so the motion carries. We'll round down. And I will um, note that I have to amend the figure as well. I just know that I don't think cars are much as we would like them to obsolete for some time. And they are an important function of the city. And I think this doesn't prohibit people from adding more parking spaces. The question is, where do we draw the line for the minimum number of parking spaces in order to Maybe make Maybe recognizes use. the fact that fewer people are having cars, or they're having one car instead of two. Dash 13. Okay, so figure uh, number 37. Well, we're still in parking. Point F and point B are conflicting. In point B, all non residential and mixed use shall provide loading. While in point F, it says an applicant for a use that will regularly receive deliveries shall demonstrate adequate off site loading. So I would prefer the second wording. Under earlier applicability requirement, you would need a loading dock for a real estate office or a dentist. Better to require applicants to demonstrate off-load, off-street loading for projects that will receive regular deliveries. Yeah. Okay with that. Uh, 3011I3, um, we're still in parking. This one is looking at regarding erosion and drainage in parking areas. The requirement is to meet section 3009. This should be deleted as all projects must meet 3011. All projects that already need to meet 3011 already have to meet 3009. When we write decisions, we always have to repeat ourselves in two places. So I would just delete high three because you already have to meet the other one. Uh, so 39, this is a yellow one, so there's a little bit of a discussion policy decision here. So uh, section 3012 is signs. So all of these ones that talk about 12, 30, 12 are talking about signs. And this one, point C13, prohibits electronic message signs except for theaters. And then in point G7 later on, there's an entire section that talks about all the requirements for having electronic signs, including what districts they're allowed in. Does, can you read those to agree with one another that, that is specific to theaters? Uh, no. 1.13 prohibits electronic signs except for theaters. Is that even right. constitutional? Uh, it, these are electronic message signs. So you can prohibit manner. Time, place, manner. Means. You could go through and say, just not what they said. Yeah. Not content. This one, yeah. this one is getting a little, <laughs> this is getting into a gray area when it says except for theaters. So I'll grant that. It should be, So I think what my Kirby's saying is, is maybe one way to read it is that they're prohibited except for theaters, but 
for theaters here are the, the restrictions. The irony is that our theaters are only found in the urban core, which is the area where they're not allowed. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> Electronic metal yeah. signs are not in the urban core, which is the only place where we That's actually have theaters. Uh, so, so, so they can't be read in the whole thing. <laughs> So, so how are they? If they're allowed in like residential six thousand, but not the downtown core. But only theaters. Residential. They're in, I think, like Riverfront, so they'd be allowed out on River Street and Route three hundred two in those areas. But um, so personally, I really dislike electronic message signs, so I would prohibit them everywhere. But I don't win that argument very often. You mean like a, a digital? The digital, the, the digital, the digital lines, or this? And time and this can go as far as the television screens. Um, go to Littleton, go to, you know, some of these other towns that have these television screens. In On inside. the streets. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Go to Littleton. R drive through I'll, 302. I'll go out there. I was going to say, this is like Vegas. And where do we have some, where, where, where was the most recent one I saw? Was there something about, um, out on River Street, was there something about the um, um, filling stations, the gas stations? Yeah. Was that where it came up before? Well, they, they don't have... It's come up on the domino sign because it's got the ticker underneath. Oh, I didn't even notice that. Okay. Yeah, it's got a ticker underneath. Um, so there are a number of... Usually where it ends up coming up is everyone goes and says, oh, but we want to have it when I was in Barrie. We want to have it for the BOR. So they uh, waited until after I left to finally get that through to put up there. The BOR? Um, the auditorium. Oh, yeah. So there's a sign at the end of the road that's for events coming up, so it's now a television screen. Yeah. Is that the one that's right on Main Street? Right on Main Street, yeah. yeah. But if you allow it for one, then you've got to allow it for everybody, so right. pretty much that was what my argument for them always was. As soon as you allow it for them, Burger right. King and everybody else is going to be allowed to have these signs. So. But right now we're only allowing them for theaters. But the theaters, do they, they don't use electronic signs. They right. generally don't. They're putting them on the inside of the windows, what? so they're exempt from our zoning. Which is oh right, the Savoy. Well, the Savoy is on the inside. Yeah, the old school Marquet. Which is which is not electronic. No. Under the definition for zoning, yeah. I'm just gonna. Yeah. Just gonna have some <laughs> definition. As long as it's on the inside of the glass, it's not regulated anyways, and that's usually where they put them. So. No. They put them on the inside of a display window, so it makes them exempt from the zoning anyway. So. So it seems like we could do two one person one stone. We could clarify this and also just remove the theater reference. Just. Right. Just citywide, equal playing field. Everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Is everyone comfortable with that? So the decision would be to prohibit, pass, just prohibit them everywhere. Yeah, to right. not to not provide an exception, and then to take out all um, sections on the requirements for electronic signs. G seven. Yeah, G seven. Yeah, It'll make me very happy. I don't know if it'll pass, but. <laughs> I just see these Why things. Wouldn't it? Why? Yeah, is anyone lobbying for? I'd be surprised how many t people start to come in with exceptions. We'll see. I would love to see them prohibited. I I think they're a big problem, this didn't and they come tend up to at grow. all in our first round. So. Yeah, that's the only thing I remember is John Anderson Sandwich talking boards? about something about, and I don't know if it was related to this section, but it had to do with his his. Um, clients who had yes. filling stations. On. Yeah, but that yeah, was only, that was the um, The only exception that I've put into mind has signs, been I think. Yeah, has been the digital price signs. Yes. That yeah, was the only exception I usually put in was a no not, but if you want to have just the red light bulbs and for the gas stations that say what the price is so that way they're not out there at 40 below zero replacing the numbers. But talk about digital price signs separately if you want. I think if that gets if that's going to get caught up in this, I would be fine with going ahead and allowing that. It's more of a standard. My, my concern is more with once we I think we already do allow that, the, don't we? Yeah. Once we allow the cat out of the bag for these these television marquees that everybody who sells from Dunkin' Donuts to everything else can put up a television set. And yeah, it's horrible. <laughs> it is. So, it, yeah, when you see them, next time somebody already... sees these things, you're going to go and say, oh, that's what Mike well, was maybe, I think the digital for gas is allowed. Digital already. for price signs is okay. Price. Okay. 
So is that not That's considered good. an electronic message? It technically Just, is. Oh, uh, we we specific we talked about it in when when I did the exemption for Barry, we talked about specifically um, nothing that was internally illuminated. Yeah. So that took out neon, um, any of the the light light bulbs or any of these other ones, and then we because there were already digital price signs for Cumberland Farms and a couple others, the gas station owner says, well, it's not fair that I still had my old signs, and when I go to upgrade, I, I'll be at a competitive disadvantage to my guy across the street who's got the digital price signs that he can change easily, and so we carved out exceptions that said, yeah, for gas stations, we'll let you guys do digital price signs. but." It doesn't give you television screens as well. It's just so it's a different category yeah. of signs. So what do we have in our zoning about the gas station I, type of signs? I would have to look that up specifically. Yeah. I think we allow them. We do. That's what I thought too. So I can clean that up. That's good. Like I said. Okay. Um, what was the exact uh, proposal? Uh, well, actually, it'll prohibit electronic signs, so I'll just have to go through and clean up the language for point C13, where it says except for theaters, we'll have to fix that. Um, and then we won't need section point G7 at all because, because we don't allow electronic signs, we don't need to have rules to explain what you need to do to have them. And there's statutory construction. If we had the rules explaining how they're allowed, that should be interpreted that they must be allowed somewhere. So yes, that's a problem. people, yeah, and generally, the general rule, just so everybody knows, if, if your zoning conflicts, the, uh, the benefit goes to the property owner. At least that's what's always told zoning administrators. So if you have something that says, you know, you're allowed one unit per 5,000 square feet, and then a little bit later on it says you're one unit per 5,500 square feet, then it's, well, which one is it? it the benefit goes to whatever is more generous to the property owner. Both of those which is why you always go and say, don't ever, always say something once. If you yeah, say it twice, that's you're going right. to have a chance of yeah. conflicting yourself, so. It's like drawings. You only put it on the drawings once. Yep. Yeah, say it once. Um, so. Um, that takes care of 3940. We're still in signs, and this one specifically goes to dominoes. Uh, figure 316, cons um, considering the dominoes sign can now be only replaced with a 12 square foot sign. Mm -hmm. So under the old zoning, they could have had a 37 square foot sign. They constructed a 55 square foot sign. We won't get into why. It was an accident. <laughs> Has to do with how things were calculated. Um, they have been willing, or were willing, to go down to the 37.5 square foot, but not the 12, which is why we're still left with the big sign and not a small, not a smaller sign. And isn't that an internally illuminated sign? No, I don't believe it's, it's internally illuminated. It's not considered that. It is. It is. It's it's like it's like oh, it does. <laughs> it is. It is internally illuminated. You are right. So how does that fit into this whole discussion? Uh, internally illuminated signs are, are, are a separately regulated category. We can prohibit them. That won't make that one go away. It just prevents new ones from the future from having internally illuminated signs. There's some communities that do that and say <coughs> you have to have That's externally illuminated That's what John Anderson lights. pushed us on. Oh, okay. He wanted to allow... He wanted to make sure internally illuminated signs were okay. Were okay. So, oh. Just because he has clients and he was saying having someone have to go out on ice on a ladder that was the change. gas that was the gas uh, thing it was I think that was the digital price side yeah, yeah. yeah. but That's the other one was that some of them like the Cumberland farm sign that already exists it had, I thought it had to do with that as well because wow. those yeah, are internally illuminated yeah those are internally illuminated so this one is just looking at um, at just the size, the size. so okay. we recommended um, what I recommended to City Council when this came up was that we should treat Crossroads Neighborhood. So the Crossroads Neighborhood is yeah. in Riverfront, but what I said was for signs, 
we should have signage based on Eastern Gateway rather than Riverfront because most of them in that small little neighborhood over there, they really tend to be more similar in character to the, the, uh, the other district, the Eastern Gateway District. Eastern Gateway would allow them to have 32 square foot sign, which is still less than the old 37, and it's still... So what is an example of a 32 foot sign and a 12 foot sign? A uh, 12 foot sign is four foot by three foot. Well, no, I, I know, I mean, I'm thinking signs in town. Oh, signs in town, oh. Uh, I actually went through and did a whole look at ones for the downtown um, Barb, do you have any uh, idea? Uh, four foot by three foot? That's going to be some, even some of these small. Even the boutiques probably have signs bigger than that. Yeah, they're pretty, well, it's those a pretty are, small Yeah, those sign. are sign band signs, though. Here we just split the difference and get a 20, 22. Well, um, so I, have, I was there when the council had this discussion, and it was uh, the counselors from my district, District 3, which... I'm the only commissioner here in District 3. Yeah. Um, I think there's a concern that that street is just going to turn more into the Eastern Gateway than neighborhood like. And we are allowing commercial development there, but the idea is that you wanted to maintain sort of neighborhood character and having smaller signs would help protect that a little bit. Um, and I was supportive of it. I live over there. That's how I felt was, like, I don't want a huge sign. The domino sign is <laughs> everybody's. The favorite. smells waft up to my street as well. <laughs> but, uh, it's, yeah, it's, I mean, it is what it is. The sign is what it is. But it's, it's also visible from downtown, though. I don't think it's just a your neighborhood problem. I think yeah. it is related to downtown more than the Eastern Gateway. And the, and yeah. Well, the question yeah, is, is, it, is it more to do with the fact that they're internally illuminated signs that are very bright, or is it the fact that the sign, remember, that's a 55-square-foot sign, so cut that sign size in half. So it's 5 half by 10? It's, it's that large? That's a 55-square-foot sign, yeah. yes. Yeah, okay. It's not that... You can see it from two side. sides. Right. That doesn't have anything to do with it, right? Yeah. That has that's to do with where, the mistaken calculation. That's where the oh, that's calculation the mistake mistake calculation. came in. Okay, I see. And what is that? the oh, internal illumination? It's allowed to have internal illumination under the old zoning. I don't know if it's allowed to have internal illumination under the new zoning. I, but hadn't we warned the new zoning, so it needed to be reviewed under both? No, we hadn't yet. It's when the council reviews, when the council warrants it, not when the planning commission warrants it. Yeah, I don't, I would have to look up to see what's up with internally illuminated, but I... I remember because Mike and I were emailing back and forth about whether we should respond to front porch forum yeah. explaining this wouldn't be allowed under the yeah, new zoning, and then we realized it wouldn't no, be allowed uh, under the current zoning. Internally illuminated signs are not permitted. Okay, well, there we go. So it's already, we've solved one problem already That's with great. internally illuminated signs are not allowed. Actually, that might only be in the design review district. Hold okay. On. Well, we'll just expand that district to cover the <laughs> Well, I didn't look at internal illumination. If you would like me to, rather than have us spend a bunch of time here, I can look at the question of internal illumination separately. Yeah, I think that would be helpful. It's prohibited. Uh, in the design, he thinks it, it might it have been is, part of the And then it says uh, internally illuminated signs are prohibited except where specifically allowed. Oh, no. <laughs> so now we need to know where they're specifically allowed. Well, why don't you take the time to look that up? Because I think that was. And then there's no reference to any other internally <laughs> illuminated we can still we can still resolve number forty though. Um, yeah, and, it seemed and like we can always be clear if we say we don't we want to start to prohibit internally eliminated signs. We can always investigate that as a separate motion. Yeah. So and as for size. Though. So as for size, let's. And, and you propose thirty two. I I would treat this the same as rather than creating a new set of rules, I would just 
treat it the same as Eastern Gateway, which would limit it to 32 square feet, which is a five by six sign. I'm trying to think over there. I remembered, so we've got Domino's, we've got Dunkin' Donuts. Dunkin Donuts. I think five, the five. Dunkin' Donuts sign was relatively small. I think if you were to look at the other yeah. signs going down, you know, five yeah. by six is, I don't know. A person by a person? Yeah, I mean, it's not, there's six feet like that, so we're not talking about. Yeah. Why Shaw's is probably a 40, 50, 60 square foot sign. I mean, right. those are big, big signs. And that's yeah. building mounted, though. Mike, if, if there was an error, why are we negotiating with them if they have to replace it? Why don't they? We made the error. Yeah. Well, so what? There's a mistake. And they're going to replace it. That's, this, that, that sign's there. This is that, if, if, yeah, that sign was there. When the sign came out, they, you know, we contacted them and said we've been getting a lot of complaints about it, and they said, well, we'd be willing to, you know, we explain the fact that, in fact, their sign is too big, but they followed all the rules, they applied, they put all the dimensions in there, we just, the old zoning calculated square footage based on both sides. So when the limit came up, it said you can have 75 square foot of signage, and our zoning administrator looked at it and said, oh, well, they're only using 57 square feet. They're fine. 57 square feet on one side, not two sides. So they actually was, it was way too big of a sign. Yeah. But by then, we had already, they followed the legal process. And so they came back and said, we'd be willing to do some work to try to go and make the sign smaller because we want to be good neighbors. They were going to swap it out. With they were going to swap it out. They agreed to swap it out to a smaller sign of 32 square feet. If? Well, they were going to do it. But they hadn't submitted their permit yet. And then city council voted to make the rule 12 square feet. And they said, we are not going to go to a 12 square foot sign. We can't get a permit for a 32 square foot sign. So they said, we'll just walk away and leave it at 55 square feet. The question I was trying to ask, if they have the benefit of a mistake, mm -hmm. and that's there. They've got that benefit. But that doesn't go on forever. If they have to change that sign or do something, why doesn't it fall under some minimum? It would depend on, you'd have to go to the non-conforming rules and start seeing how much of a change and what they're changing. Um, and it could be there for 20 years before that well, sign needs to true. be replaced. Can we, uh, can we require conformance within a uh, certain number of years, like seven years? No, you can do that. If we wanted to do that, which South Burlington and a couple other communities did, we would have to go through and, and, and remove signs from the zoning, which you have guaranteed non-conforming grandfathering. You'd have to adopt it as a sign chapter ordinance. 71 sign or 61 sign ordinance. Which um, we did in the past, didn't we? You did could we do that. Listed the non-conforming signs in the downtown district, like the lobster mm, pot one. Well, they actually got rid, they actually voted to get rid of those. Right, right, but right. No, so the non-conforming signs go for any non-conforming sign. Um, they had just gone and exempted certain signs from even the non-conforming rules that says, no matter what, they can always keep these signs. Yeah. They were historic. They were historic. historic. signs, yeah. <laughs> right. The little Oscar. Excuse me, but I, yeah. I just, it's 55 now, but they're willing to change it to 37. Yeah, but they can't get a permit for it. Without what? Because it would violate the zoning, which says you can only have 12. They could never get a permit. They could never get a permit. If they're going to take down that sign, they have to come into conformity, which would mean a 12-square-foot sign. And they said, we're not going to a 12-square-foot sign. So they got Just give them another fake permit. <laughs> 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 another mistake. Come on, we can make mistakes. There's um, enforcement discretion. So that's why we're negotiating. We're going to get a smaller sign. Yeah, they were, I just don't want to make do a policy decision sign. about that area based on one entity. One sign. And particularly right. when we need and then now we're negotiating. That's that's the only thing I just want to caution everyone about. Yeah, I, I, I just wanted to put 40 back on there. to force them to comply through a separate ordinance. But, but the other signs in that area are not as small as 12 square feet. No. The gas stations and pretty much all those signs are bigger than that. 
I would imagine they're all going to be bigger than 12 square feet, yeah. So why did council select 12 square feet? Miss that uh, because that's the requirement for riverfront district the oh. table goes by zoning district and what I pointed out to them was that because crossroads is part of riverfront district it would actually end up with this really small set of signs yeah and it really would be more consistent with eastern, eastern gateway. gateway and they didn't agree with that change so mm. and you don't want to have another standard for this area because you'd have to make a whole new zoning we could, district? We could Is that make another thought? standard. We could, we could make Crossroads its own district. Okay. As I said, if that's kind of the... Yeah, it would be the three gas stations and Dunkin' Donuts. How big was Dunkin' Donuts? And my, and my thought was it's a fairly... Is it actually there? Yeah, that's probably... Four by four by eight. That might be a thirty-two square foot sign. So, giving you an idea. I think four by. Eight. Without the bonus signs underneath it. With ignoring the bonus signs underneath <laughs> it that are illegal, probably. That might be a four by eight. Three what? So right now, nothing in that area would be 12 square feet, probably. There's the what, uh, what Domino's replaced. Yeah. We'd have to wait Simply for subs? It. Simply subs with probably 30 square foot signs. Yeah. None of those are there. There's 12 square feet. Isn't that funny? It's simply subs on one side, and it's different on the other. Uh, five by five. Four, that might be 20, 24 square yeah, feet. Like what do you think of the pre-flight? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so as I get this issue, so. we can uh, live forever with one horrible sign, but everything else will be small. Yes. Yeah. And we can't get rid of the horrible sign anyhow. We, yeah. to go to the, we can. Well, we go, comes to 37. So if we, we can get rid of all of the... Is it, is it possible to do a phased in zoning? Like with, with a statue, you could have a statue that phases in over time. Um, so we could do 32 feet now, and then in five or 10 years, it becomes 20 or 12 or. As the, as the non lawyer, I'm going to guess no, just because the Title 24, I mean, being Dylan's rule, we can only do what we're allowed to do, and I don't know if that's specifically allowed. We have to treat things uniformly. Well, it is uniformly, it's just not uniformly over time. It's yeah. broad enough that we can. I think it's somebody can make the question of, yes or of, no. of, of when something becomes effective. Disallow it for Are we day? allowed to delay <laughs> the effectiveness of something that's passed? I don't know. Boycott but the, but my sense is this this is not something that I can't enforce. I can enforce this. It was just one of those ones that I wanted to make sure we put it back out there so everyone knew. We we had written in it was going to be one way. The city council changed it, made it 12 square feet. Now we're kind of at a point where we're like, let's throw it back to the city council that if they're the ones who decided this, leave leave language as discussion. it is. Wait, so the language as it is is 12 square is 12, feet. 12, which yeah, means that we're not going to get dominoes to replace their spawn. Yes. Spot. I think City Council is going to have this conversation all over again. We could yeah. potentially revoke their permit after a hearing, though, right? I mean, they would get a right to a hearing for sure. Uh, to process, but. I don't think we can we revoke them. Though. We can yeah, only revoke, revoke or avoid based on misinformation or misrepresentation. They did not misrepresent their application, they presented it exactly what they were going to build, and we approved it and said, yes, that's fine. We'd have and they to build pass it. this in front of them and give them a number of years. Yeah. Okay, what John is talking about is uh, South Burlington a number of years ago went through, for example, and wanted to clean up all of their streetscapes from signage that had been, they had a lot of plastic signs, internally illuminated signs, so they wanted to get rid of them. 
they went to a very uniform size, it was a great sign ordinance, and basically said, you have so many years. And it got pushed a couple times because councillors would eventually get reelected, and then the councillors would say, well, we'll delay the implementation for an extra year, another two more years to come to the compliance. But eventually, with a few exceptions, Al's French fries, <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. And a couple others that were exempted, but there weren't too many that, that made it. Everybody else had to come into compliance, and they all did. Well, so. that's the way the state sign law was implemented. You can have your horrible sign here for so many years. Yeah, we just can't do that under zoning. Under zoning, it's it's locked into that um, pre um, that non-conforming rule. The grandfathering rule applies, and we really can't get out of that one. So what communities do is they'll just move to an ordinance in order to bring people into compliance, which we could do as a community. That sounds like the solution to this problem. I mean, they have a vested interest in their mistake, but not forever. Yeah. Uh, that's your idea, essentially. If you can do it by ordinance, mm -hmm. I would recommend that you have a uh, phase-out ordinance. But for the zoning for number 40, the decision is to leave as is? Well, if you're going to propose leave as is because there's no good way out of it, then let's suppose a proposed an ordinance, suggested an ordinance, it is a good way out of it. Are you saying doing a signed ordinance like South Burlington did? Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. we would yeah, work on that. That would be a separate that. process yeah. that okay. would take some time for me to. Well, okay, but, but they got 20 years of a horrible sign. <laughs> Why not run it into five? <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. But you're saying that we should, I mean, we should bring that up to City Council that we suggest a sign ordinance. Well, I think we yeah. should tell them this is a dilemma. Yeah. And we recommend that you do an ordinance to phase out signs that are detrimental to the appearance of the community, whatever phrase you want to put on there. Let's identify what we want and work towards that as opposed to... Yeah, I don't know, 12 feet seems kind of small for a gas station, but... Um, Quaint neighborhood gas station? <laughs> yes, you're very... Gas shop, PPE. <laughs> <laughs> a shoppy, yes. <laughs> you don't have... Ye old gas shop? People already stopped at the intersection. They don't have to be able to see it from 100 yards away. Our state sign ordinance is one of the great things that happen around here, so why can't we do it? Yeah. Okay. Well, so, as all right. So, we, we recommend uh, a sign ordinance to deal grandfather signs. With grandfather yep. signs. Leave as is, suggest sign ordinance to council. Number 41. So after signs, we get into these, um, the 31s, and those are all special uses. So in this case, we're talking about room and boarding houses. And in this case, for whatever reason, there's a specific requirement that says, um, Rooming and boarding houses shall not have kitchens. Um, and we actually had somebody who had one or was proposing one. And we had an application where an applicant had an existing rooming and boarding that had small kitchens. They thought breakfast kitchens would be nice. And what is the harm in the added benefit of a private breakfast kitchen? Staff agrees and feels they should not be required, but should not be restricted either so what does Chris think about this Chris Lundgren it just would it, if it any if it has kitchen facilities then it's going to meet it's going to fall into a different what is code it? code what classification, is code that's, classification. That's, yeah that's my point but, yeah then it would otherwise yeah so I guess it's just a matter of whether or not the yeah, if you want to do the kitchen for, from that. a zoning standpoint then you're going to have to meet the kitchen requirements of the building ordinance Okay. What about the breakfast kitchen? The breakfast kitchen. What, what is a breakfast kitchen? <laughs> yeah, what is a breakfast kitchen? Right. I don't know. It's, it's. I'm sure it's just you're looking more. You're looking more as a, at a small, at a mini fridge and. 
it hasn't been defined. Small There's no definition of it? No, it's not an open flame. Well, if it's a may, then we don't really have to get into the details of what specifically. If we're going to require a kitchen, then we have to get very specific about, okay, what's a kitchen? But if we're just saying, you don't have to have a kitchen, but if you want to have a kitchen, you can have a kitchen. Is there a definition of a kitchen? I doubt I it. Don't, I doubt it, but I don't think we'll need it because it's an option. In the, but in the building code, is there a distinction between... That'll be in the building code, though. What's that? The building code will be a separate code. No, I know, but I, I'm just wondering if there's a distinction between a breakfast-type kitchen and a kitchen with an open flame. no idea. Kind of or frying or all of that. Well, know. changing it to May would allow that also. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd be worried about it if it did, but it's not my building. We're currently banning kitchens but not defining them, though. Yeah. 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 It, under this one, it says, rooming and boarding houses shall not have okay. kitchens, individual kitchens. And this person has an existing rooming and boarding house and said, well, yeah, but I have small kitchens in my... I don't see anything in the definition section for my kitchen. So if we're going to fuss with it, we probably ought to tell people what it is. Well, uh, not in a May. If, it's, if, it's, if we're not requiring it, then I don't think we have to define it as, as much. Can we just remove it rather than having a May, though? Okay, so we can remove it, What's the point of saying you may have a kitchen? That's just kind of like, you may have a... Laboratory, but we well, it's just somebody came in. It's it just in, more informational. If somebody came in and said, "I've got a room in rooming and boarding house, or I'm proposing a rooming and boarding house, but can I have kitchens?" May I have a breakfast kitchen? Well, if we take, well, as, as Kirby said, if we take out the restriction, uh, yeah. then because it, it says rooms shall not include private assumed. kitchen facilities, yeah. whereas bed and breakfast don't say anything about it. They don't address it. But can you have a kitchen in a bed and breakfast? Well, it's not yeah. prohibited. It's not uh, prohibited, so... Yeah, yeah. but it's, uh, yeah, it becomes dif difficult because B&Bs are only allowed in single-family homes, so... It doesn't hey, matter. Doesn't can matter. you have four <laughs> kitchens and... <laughs> yeah, but a breakfast kitchen is not really a kitchen. No. Just, don't just don't cook kitchen. dinner there. Yeah, yeah. Whatever, just, yeah. You yeah. Right. whatever it is. <laughs> you don't want people cooking cook a dinner there. So anyway. it is the decision then... Don't make a sandwich for lunch. I'm, I'm, it's Kirby's like decision to strike A5. Strike it, yeah. That's more elegant, yeah. A5 is now struck. Uh, 3201. We are now in 32's our site plan. Uh, a desire to add an informational note above 3201 to be included with 3201. My recommendation would be to change 3201 title to be applicability and major minor site plan determination. Next, I would move point A to be point B and add a new point A to say all development shall meet the requirements of this chapter except parcels used for one and two dwelling units. So the reason for this addition is because we had a lot of people who would look at site plan and they would be like, and not realize that single and two families don't have to meet it. So um, it has all these other things for determinations, but it really wasn't getting into the fact that single and two family by state law are exempt from site plan. So we tried to explain, well, it's written in a note in this spot over here and it's in chapter four, but everybody said, everyone looks in the same place. They all look in chapter three, they look at the regulations and they preferred to see it. Anyone have okay. any concerns? Okay. I think you should rewrite we're, it. we're good, Mike. All right. 3202, change title to bike and pedestrian access and circulation. You remember that discussion we just had? Mm -hmm. This is where it showed up. So rather than talking about vehicular access and circulation, it should be bike and pedestrian access and circulation. Sounds good. 3202.C, uh, applicant had confusion about this requirement and believed it would be void for vagueness if challenged. What does the requirement mean for a proposal that will add two dwelling units to a duplex? Uh, do units in residential 9,000 count as supporting alternative transportation simply because they're close to the downtown? Um, it's pretty smushy. It says the applicants shall demonstrate that the proposed development enables energy efficient modes of transportation such as walking, biking, transit, electric vehicles, carpooling or car sharing as feasible and appropriate given the location and use. 
Yeah, so they they argued that it was pretty vague. I don't know if anyone else wants to oh you bet your so, regulations there. I mean if you think about how that would how could that apply. What is this what context is this in? I mean that might help me understand it a little bit more. So it's inside the site plan. It's in site plan for bike and pedestrian, so in this case, um, somebody's coming in for building, I think this, the complaint came from somebody who was building a multifamily unit on Elm Street close to downtown. So in like a residential 3,000 area, or residential 9,000 in this one, just using as an example. Um, but it was relatively close to downtown. And the question was, how do I meet this alternative transportation requirement? It doesn't make any sense to me. I'm already in the downtown. I mean, do I automatically get to be in the downtown because mm -hmm. and meet alternative transportation just because I'm a duplex? Well, because you have proximity to walking. Proximity to biking. walking and biking. Yeah. I already have a sidewalk out front. I mean Yeah, I do they have a sidewalk out front, I guess would be Yeah, it seems a little intentioned, but we already have requirements for bike access, sidewalks. Um, various landscaping ones. Front facing. Yeah. I think we've done a good job at making sure that the outcome is what this swishier thing wants by being more specific. Yeah. So, so we I, could just scrap it. Yeah, I think my recommendation that I had here was I think you should add more detailed requirements to point A and point B if you think they are needed. And then strike point C, which I think is what John was basically saying. Yeah. Sounds good to me. So, so let's we're going to strike C. Yeah, let's just strike C. Do you think we need more details from point A and point I, B? I don't think so, but I think if somebody were feeling we didn't, that they wanted more, I think that's, I wouldn't amend point C to be yeah. better. Yeah. I would amend A and B if you think there's something that's not addressed enough. Is everyone uncomfortable with just striking C, point C and not changing it, A and B? It, it seems like it leaves out the electric vehicle part, but I don't know how you create a requirement for that anyway. Then they could just be looking at, are we going to require them to put, you know, plug-in stations and all of that. Well, it's, pretty, so, it's pretty drastic. So, considering we don't require parking spaces in some cases so <laughs> you yeah. don't have parking spaces no but parking. now we're going to make you put in a parking space and it's going to be an electric plug-in yeah. 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 right 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 plug it sounds like it's right. comfortable with striking point all, right. C. all right 45 and this will probably consume a vast chunk of time this is the number one problem with these new regulations is section 3203. Whoa, I can't believe you're already Landscape. ready to make that decision. Oh. How about the number one problem of 20? The number one problem of these regulations. <laughs> I will guarantee <laughs> when I get it. done explaining this, you guys will be like, oh, that doesn't make any sense. That's foolish. Um, 3203? 3203 is landscaping. So generally, there are no rules to address non conforming or waivers. So that's the big umbrella we're looking at. The rules for landscaping are extremely strict. For example, a change of use from retail to office requires site plan approval. But even though there are no external changes being proposed, they'll still have to meet these requirements. Property with non-conforming landscaping could mean tens of thousands of dollars in landscaping are required. This has come up in every single application we've received. Some issues include a property with two ancient trees, really big trees, but are required to have four trees and have asked if they need to cut down the two massive trees to make room for four smaller trees because they are required to have four trees. Uh, the standards are able to be met in rural and suburban lots, but not in urban ones. There's also no conversion between trees and shrubs. So if I need eight trees and 50 shrubs, but I have 10 trees and 40 shrubs, do I need to cut down two of my trees to plant 10 shrubs? These are actual things we have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Another area has an exact acre of vacant land behind the developed portion of the lot and asked if they could just plant their trees and shrubs back there, which technically they can do. So they could just take all of their shrub and tree requirements and plant them in the back 40. Um, so to decide how to fix 
amending these rules, you should look back at the purpose. Why do we require the landscaping at all? Point A gives a purpose which is good and helps to decide what we want to see. Considering the emphasis is on, quote, the appearance from public vantage points and creating shade along sidewalks, one person has suggested changing the standard to read building frontage rather than building perimeter. So the new requirement, the old, the requirement in effect right now says for every foot of building perimeter, you need to plant a tree or shrub. Not frontage, but building perimeter. Um, and they're saying, well, just change it to building frontage and require the plantings to be between the building front line and the street. That way the rules are implementing the purpose. Uh, that was a good start, but still does not address trees to shrubs conversion or the fact that there is a fixed number of trees that need to be planted and they're therefore smaller trees rather than larger ones. Another option could be establishing a minimum amount of planting area per linear foot. Figure 20 establishes those numbers, including material, plant material size, so we could say five square feet of planting for every foot of building perimeter. Application with 40 feet of building frontage could provide 200 square feet. Considering the property had two existing large trees in the front yard, they would have met that requirement two times 100 square feet. Had those trees not existed, they would have, they could have planted eight medium trees and a few shrubs. Perhaps it works like the shading requirements. I'm open to some ideas, um, but this was just, this was the biggest thing is these numbers. When it gets into that perimeter requirement, 3.03, things like point D in some of the tables, specifically point G1. Well, the problem is defining numbers of trees and shrubs when your real objective is to have shade. It, it's and, either shed, and, and, shade, and, and, or design, yeah. And, so Could it just be a percentage of the building costs, of their project costs allocated to landscaping, and they have to just make it awesome? That's so. That's one. That's one option. Like vagueness. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, but it is that is actually one option. So one thing you could do is go and say for non-conforming, um, it's a percentage of project cost. We we can require you to do all of this, but it can't cost more than two percent of the total project cost. We already get project costs for building permits, so we already are going to get that number. So you could go through and say, well. Really, it's a fifty thousand dollars to fix this, but because it's only a ten thousand dollar project, they only need to do two hundred dollars worth of improvements. It's a change of use it doesn't make sense. So the, I'm looking at the frontage piece. If it's if this is a really long building and they don't have a lot of frontage, or if it doesn't fit, it's mm -hmm. the other issue that you run into. So if you only have this much space, we have to plant as many trees, and they all have to be front. I don't think that would. I can see that potentially not working, depending on their site. Yeah, so the, the, the other options are we can look at waiver requirements. It just goes through and says you have to do this, but here are some waiver requirements that you can go to the board and go and say, I can't meet these requirements because I have two big trees here. And the board can say, okay, you've got two big trees. that We, we agree that will substitute for your landscaping requirement. Or, because they provide enough shade. Yeah, whether you're talking about shade or whether you're talking about aesthetics from landscaping. Some landscaping doesn't necessarily have to be for shade. It can be Smart. just... Softening That's the, yeah, the softening the appearance and. Where did these numbers come from originally? These are directly from Brandy, so I don't know where she got them from. But she is by training a landscape architect, so it may be something that comes out of ALSA or one of those. Yeah. And Does somebody else already have some sort of conversion in their zoning that, that we could use, like what a large tree is worth? <laughs> There was a little bit on the table that's what was this one? Uh, 320. Talks a little bit about, you know, if you see minimum Sizes. planting area, we actually have these minimum planting area things. So if you have a large tree, I would switch oh. some of the orders of things, like the, match, the mature or mat maintained height really should be over next to the plant material. The columns aren't in the right places because a large tree, the definition of large tree is 50, greater than 50 square feet mature. So we really should move those over there. And, but ignoring that little twist, the minimum planting oh. area though, if you were gonna plant one large tree, you'd get credit for 100 square feet. So if we started to look towards 
that kind of scenario, then you could go through and say, well, I'm going to plant two large trees because I'd rather have two large trees than 15 small shrubs. But you could never plant a tree that was 15. No, 15 but it's the back. mature if height. You'd existing. be planting a tree that would be growing to that height eventually, yeah. Oh, I see what you're saying. Right, but it's not currently. It's not currently. Yeah, so would we say within a certain number of years? Yeah, we would have, have a, we, you'd probably tree. have to have a minimum caliper and a minimum height. Yeah. So if you're going to plant a large tree, it would have to be at least 18 feet tall or something yeah. at planting. Right now when it's yeah. planted. Or when, you know, we'd have to talk to an arborist or tree board or somebody to go through and find out what are reasonable figures for what, what would be a planting height for a large tree and medium tree and a small tree. But now we're talking about you know the minimum planting area, so you get credit for bigger trees if you've got them. And you know one big tree could be worth more. And I, I you know I kind of tried to figure out some new numbers. You know maybe a medium tree would be worth 36 instead of 24. I was trying to think. So three medium trees would equal one three big medium tree. Three trees would equal one, rather than 24, which seemed a little small. It seemed to go for small trees are 16, medium trees are 24, big trees are 100. It kind of seemed like a big jump there. So. Is this, is this type of thing common in, in zoning regs? You can't just Usually say, they're more general. They're usually not as specific. Yeah, and then there's some discretion in the DRB eventually. The question is, what can you enforce? I think counting trees and shrubs sounds like a medieval nightmare. It has been. It has been for people who've been trying to count the shrubs that are existing around their property. You know, especially for something like a quadplex, and they're going out there and saying, "I'm looking at a spreading juniper. Is How that one that? or is that four? I mean, I kind of see four stems going in, but is it one plant or is that four? Um, you know, uh, I think the other one they were joking about was their lilac. They just had just, it was just coated with just little lilac stems and, you know, we, they could count them all day because it was just sprouting out of the ground. Or in two years it might send or more suckers out. It so might send more suckers stay. out and 50 of them may die, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. it's just, uh, it, was a, it was a very difficult to enforce set of rules and the DRB has asked you know, almost every time they have a meeting they're like, Planning Commission gotten a solution for this yet? Can they recommend something? They've been enforcing back to the purpose. So they kind of went yeah, back to the purpose statement and said, we're going to, because the rules don't work, they just flat don't work, we're going back to this and trying to work our way back. But they, they recognize they really shouldn't be. But, but can they, do they have ideas for what the rules should be? I think they wanted less numerical. So here's, they, they would prefer to have performance standards and guidelines. The hard part is half of our zoning permits are now administrative. So we have a lot of administrative site plans which make a little bit of the performance standards a little bit harder because zoning administrators are supposed to be more objective. But we thought we could have some that we would do and if it reaches a certain point the zoning administrator has the right to refer. And I think a zoning administrator just has to put their hands up sometime and say, this is getting a little arbitrary on whether or not it is creating an aesthetic something from the street, you know, whatever the performance standard is. Couldn't you develop some pictures and say this is great and this is lousy and this is, I mean, that would be a standard which would show shading and breaking up facades with planting and planting. It would do, give you some kind of a clue as to what the purpose you're trying to accomplish and take the numbers out of it. Does the parking garage make this stand? <laughs> they don't have to. So is the worry that if we have a, I guess a performance standard, I don't know what that would look like, then, I mean the DRB would then have to most of them. Is, or would, yeah. that, would that be the case? Yeah, it sounds like? we could, yeah, we would, it would be more likely that the, if we don't have clear guidelines, the zoning administrator just may reach a point that they can't make a call on something. But we can certainly go through and try to write them in such a way. If, so I guess at this point, what's most important is that if 
the discussion here is that the purpose of this section is to protect the quality of life and community character by enhancing the appearance of the built environment as viewed from the vantage as viewed from public vantage points creating shade along sidewalks and walkways and within parking lots, providing a landscape buffer between residential and non-residential land uses, and screening land uses that develop, land uses and development that create visual clutter and distraction. So can so it be- So we like that purpose, I can start to build off that. Yeah, can we clean it up so that maybe it makes a little more sense, but then if uh, someone would like, if it would, should be, refer to the DRB, then basically they have the discretion to decide whether or not it meets the intent of the... Well, so there's some specificity, and if it meets that, that's great, but if not, they have the option? Yeah, I think so. So you're thinking of keep keeping this but cleaning it up? I take all the numbers out, just leave the purpose. Or, well, if we can keep it to allow for some administrative mm -hmm. permits in the instances that it makes sense, that's great, but then if it doesn't, I, send I'm, it to the DRB. I like the idea of developing a conversion chart for the administrative approvals so that there's flexibility. We've done that for a number of them, so actually that's a good idea. We, we did that for a number of them. We had, we had rules that said, if you meet this, I can administratively issue your permit. If you can't, then you can go to the DRB, and these are the rules that they would follow. So I think that I can put something together that has some numbers and maybe we'll use those conversion you know those ones that we had there for square footage try to manipulate those a little bit and if you can meet those great you we can check the box and say yeah you have enough trees and landscaping they're in the correct place you have to have so much they've got to be in this area and this is what we're going to count and if you meet that you check the box you can get your administrative site plan approval if not there are more subjective standards that you can go to the DRB for and get a waiver. Okay. And that works. There's obviously got to be some judgment call on the projects here. Yeah. It can't just be by the numbers because they don't work. Yeah. And, 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 yeah. The more options we can give people, the more headaches. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, if, if, if it's clear, we, we don't really care. It really goes to the to the the issue we have right now is, is people come in and they they're, they run into a box. There's no waivers and there's no non-conforming rules in here. So we have no way to go and give somebody an exception that says, yeah, yeah, you, you're what you have is fine. You don't need to do any more landscaping, but we can't. Um, so. So you I think will you could put something together that yeah works. now that I've got a, a, an agreed upon idea that to kind of work with I'll come up with some language that we can all chew on but this is really the the biggest one that comes up in as I said literally every non single family application this is, is it the number worth car is it worth carving out this recommendation and sending that to council right away it could be I mean it sounds like this is a, a an issue that comes up if constant. this is going to take us, yeah, if this is going to take us a long time to finish getting through. You have 120 of these. Well, there's a bunch that are empty and a bunch that are green, but yes. If we think this is going to take a while, I can work on this and we can Sounds shuttle like that should, through earlier. Do folks agree we should prioritize that for the next meeting? Yeah, that's okay. Sounds great. All right. I will get something together um, so we've got a draft. Is there anyone on the tree board who might have good thoughts on how best to quantify trees that knows a little bit more than we do about that subject area? Well, I got to think John like John Snell, Snell yeah. knows. He's going to jump right he, into he this. He knows more yeah. than. He'll get right into the weeds. Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. Uh, that nice. voluntarily he won't <laughs> um, I like so the square footage approach. Yeah, I like, like that too. Like, if, if we go by square footage that's already in there, then four medium trees would equal a large tree. If you've got these things and you've already met it, you know, one of the other ones is if you also, if you've had a previously approved site plan by the DRB. Yeah. Or if you do like XDBH is worth mm -hmm. others. That's what I was thinking is trees are usually measured by diameter rest height rather than actual height. Yeah. So like mature tree, 
you, know, you measure yeah. by diameter and breast height. And yeah, but a big, really the question is, John can I've, I've had, this, but yeah, I mean, I've had a big apple tree that didn't grow very tall, right. but is that really equal to the same as a as an elm or and, yeah or maple that's or a maple that might be twice yeah, yeah twice the height? It's if, and the, providing if the more point shade. is to get shade and to do do aesthetics. Yeah. Yeah. Is your emphasis shade or is your emphasis yeah. aesthetics? Right. Because it's, the tree can actually outgrow its usefulness from an aesthetics. That's true. Then it's just a it's trunk. A that is, yeah. Yeah, then you get your neighbors that the apples are falling on. Yeah. So. <laughs> they have to eat them because they don't have a breakfast kitchen. Collect them for your breakfast. Them. You just have to eat them. Yeah. All right. Before we lose our ourselves here in this one. On. Um, 3203D. Oh, and by the way, I think we'll do a hard stop of this review at 7.15 because we okay. have a lot of minutes we got to get through. So let's see if we can get through this one in five minutes. All right, so 3203D. Did I say D? Yes. 3203D. Okay. Plant materials shall be planted in specifications 3-20, so that's just a technical mistake. Uh, and the following, the rest should be listed one, two, three, four, et cetera. Oh. oh, okay. So the rest of these. Are you? All right. So the reason, so just so people know, when we write recommendations and decisions and things, we are writing staff reports. We're referencing things. So when regulations are written in paragraph form, they become really yep. difficult. So what break should out happen each is yeah, into use separate number. should be number one. Uh, the next sentence, use of invasives is prohibited, should be number two. Uh, applicants are strongly encouraged is number three. And then I think what this was saying was that we should add a, a final number on the end, whether it's four or five, that says when counting the amount of required plant materials, the same tree or shrub can be counted towards meeting more than one requirement. Street trees, site landscaping, parking lot requirements. So within this are a couple of different sections. You'll see point F is street trees, point G is site landscaping, point H is parking lot landscaping, and point I is screening. So what we had from an administrative standpoint is we didn't know if we could double count these trees. So if a tree is next to the sidewalk and also next to the parking lot, does that tree count twice? Can I count it towards meeting that requirement and that requirement? And all this was just clarifying to say yes. You are allowed to count that same tree to meet this requirement over here and this requirement over here. Um, point okay. D and E and F were just typos. That's 47, 48, 49. Number 50, so we're still talking about site plan, landscaping. F1 and F8 use two different numbers. Unclear if the requirement is within five feet of the right of way and a waiver could allow six or more from the right of way. The waiver would allow for fixing some non-conforming sites, but it isn't a broad waiver to allow other pre-existing issues. Street trees are required in urban center and a waiver avenue exists, but that means every urban application needs to go to the DRV, basically. So street trees have been a big issue in applications that we review so far, have not been a big issue so far, but it should be clear that street trees can double counted with the total site landscaping in point G, also number two. Um, And if stated that the requirements of point F do not apply, rather than have the DRB may waive, would fix them necessarily with waiving waiver requirements. So I think I think we were just trying to get street trees exempt in the downtown as well. So the purpose of this section is, what do you want to, I'm not clear what you want to do with it. Uh, that's what I was trying to figure out. So. These are all about street trees. One and eight clearly don't agree. Yes. So we should at least have one or the other. Shall be planted within five feet of the edge of the street or right of way. 
the street right away unless otherwise recommended by the public works and they may waive the location to allow trees within six feet of the edge so yeah that was an issue there with just conflicting between those two is there a concern with planting trees that close to the street <laughs> You know, this might be one where it would be really good to have some input from the tree board since they have been doing a lot of work with street trees. Do we want to just defer that and have me work with them to get input from the I tree board what first? People think. I'm not seeing where they conflict. This is five feet? Yeah, well, it's five feet is a general rule, but then eight is an exception, so I'm not seeing why that's a problem. Yeah. All right, so maybe it's not con conflicting much as it is just confusing. Right, a waiver for one foot. This is and, it's, and that's the only thing you can get a waiver for. So you can't get a waiver for any other requirement of street trees. <laughs> just to get, the only waiver <laughs> you can get is foot. if your existing tree happens to be six feet, you can apply, and it doesn't automatically count as a street tree. It only counts if you go to the DRB and the DRB says it counts as a street tree, which would beg the question, why would we bother to go to the DRB? And and then, as I said, the other requirement is that these street trees apply to everything, including in the urban core. Uh, An ex exemption to the urban core would be helpful. I get the sense everyone's tired. Burned out. And not... <laughs> able to give you much feedback on this one so I propose right. that we pick up on this one we'll start with this one next meeting. time it's uh, number 50 did we jump past a decision on 46 it seemed like nobody had a, it was more ministerial than anything else I'm fine with it. I'm just yeah. Sure yeah 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 <laughs> and then 47 for days and I think some of these other ones may go away. If I'm bringing you guys a decision or a recommendation to prioritize the landscaping requirements, 45, 46, and this will go all the way up through 54. Okay. So I can come up with a recommendation that kind of covers all of those. Because some of these are just things I need answers to, but I don't. I think I could put together a recommendation that you guys can change numbers on and agree and disagree. You know, like parking lot trees. There's no distance from the parking lot tree. So is that tree 20 feet away? Can I count that towards shading the parking lot? There's no nothing says a tree has to be so close to the parking lot to count as shade. Some way of actually designating that it in fact does shape. I mean, it based on the the crown width and all of that. Well, then there's the angle of the sun at what time of oh, year. Oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, at some point, the, all the right. year. Okay, we plowed through several. So okay. let's turn our attention to item seven now, which is the minutes, the outstanding minutes that we have for a variety of meetings. Starting with January 22nd, give everyone a minute to find that. So can I vote on these? Probably not. Sure. Not. I was, a, I was present. She was present. So I was not, uh, Just not a member of the board. So I probably I vote on minutes when I'm not even here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you're at least on the committee. <laughs> this goes too far back. I think, I think we have enough, so you don't have to vote. Yeah, I can. Yeah. <laughs> For some reason, the January minutes just got left behind. You know the story we, we went through and read all the following minutes afterwards and did not find anywhere where we actually approved them. Okay. So. I moved to approve them. I was even there. Can you second? moved January 22? Yep. 
I'll second it. Tim. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Those abstaining? Stephanie. Okay. <laughs> and Aria. So we had four. One, two, we had four. Four, four no. Yeah. Okay. So January 22nd minutes are approved. I then move to approve May through 14th through August 27th. Well, they're not exactly consecutive, so you're yeah. going to list them all out. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Well, May 14th, 2018, July 9th, 2018, July 23rd, 2018, August 13th, 2018, and August 27th, 2018. We need okay. to talk about them Okay, well, do I have a, a second for purposes of discussion? Just to approve them all at once? Yeah. I'll second. I'd rather quickly go through. Okay. Just that we could, any discussion or edits, we could just do them instead of making a whole yeah, bunch of Yeah, okay. Motions. So let's so talk we can about. Let's go through the discussion. Why? Let's talk about May 14. Okay. Looks okay to me. Any concerns, Barb? I wasn't there, so. Uh, Kirby, Stephanie, any concerns? Okay, so moving on, so nothing to edit on that one. Uh, July 9th. Darby, or this one? Typo. Um, under comments from the chair, Kirby brought a letter of Leslie's letters. Is that a copy of Leslie's letters? What was that? I would say it was probably a copy, but I was not there. What do you think, Kirby? It's like a murder of crows. It's a letter of letters, isn't it correct? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Copy of Leslie's letter? <laughs> Who knows? All right. A copy of Leslie's letters to the committees. Anything else on this one? So is the is the was the Google Drive set up at that point in time? Um Maybe. Maybe. I okay. think so. I think it was. Yeah. I don't think there was anything on there, but I think you had it set up. Because at the previous meeting, we'd met with Seth, so. Anything else in the July 9th meeting? Okay. July 23rd. Senates that I mentioned, the Director of Public Safety should get one. Mm -hmm. That's the Director of Public Safety of the Central Vermont Regional. Central Vermont Regional. Safety Agency, CBPS, Central Vermont Regional. He's the Director of the Central Vermont Regional Public Safety Authority. CVRPSA. Yeah. Okay. Um, I will make that change. Then on the back side, the um, item, talking about item 32 again. Um, item 32 has staff recommendations as to take off prohibition on development over 30% slopes, but make it that engineer plans and adhering are required. So removing the prohibition on development over 30% slopes, I don't think I, I don't remember voting in the affirmative on that, but I would be willing to go back and check the record. It said a motion passed on four. It was a, a vote. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where is the motion? <laughs> That's a good question. It, what was the motion? The, yeah. I mean, I, I yeah, know. I see this part. Yeah. Yeah, that was the other piece. What was there was that the outright prohibition of 30% slope period meant that even the smallest ones, you know, we couldn't, people couldn't put in curb cuts because the roadside ditches are three to one slopes, which are 30% slopes. Fixing a retaining wall, 
so we have a number of these that are were issues, they would still be required to have engineers. So if you're going to affect 30% slopes, you have to have an engineer. Well, I guess I, I mean, sounds like we need to go back and check how the voting went yeah. before was there a, there was a separation of these small issues versus the blanket development on thirty percent slopes. I mean, the, the small issues that you raised, mm -hmm. I could see could be exempt from that, but I don't. I don't know that that's the same thing as taking off the prohibition completely. Okay, so should we table July twenty third minutes then? Pending Barb's confirmation of the vote. Okay. Yeah, to be specific as to what was approved. Right, was approved. Yep. Yeah. Yep, that makes sense. Uh, August 13th, this was our all committees meeting. Corrections. Under our long list, people who attended. Uh huh. Joanne Troiano from the Montpelier Housing Board. T R I A N O. I apologize, I've got to run. You're voting so to add her because she so wasn't John, there. No, no, no. You, her name you is, made the motion. Incorrect. Do you want to just withdraw the motion and we'll redo a motion without you here? Sure, or I'm fine with any amendments Barb to wants to make. Oh, okay. So you modify the motion to incorporate the amendments discussed. Exactly. Okay. Oh, good. Troiano. Okay. Yeah. Yes. And it was. T R B. You second that. I A N O. I did. You need to make sure. Read my mind. <laughs> and the Dan Jones is not the executive director of the Energy Advisory Committee. He is the executive director of Sustainable Montpelier Coalition. That's what it said on the PowerPoint. I'm sure. I'm sure you, I'm sure you had it. Uh, yeah, because, because he wasn't there representing the advisory committee, because that's what Kate was doing. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, um, under the Energy Advisory Committee, um, second paragraph, uh, some of the strategies are conservation reducing heating and electrical fuel use by 30%, not 3%. And under the two committees down, the Montpelier Housing and Montpelier Alive, I think if that was Laura Gephardt speaking, then it was the Montpelier Development Corporation, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not Montpelier oh, Housing. Yep. And I did print out those, type up those things that you wrote up. Flip charts? The flip charts. So I don't know. If you did or did not? I did. Somebody I guess I did not. Did, if, I, if you didn't get them, then I will send them out. I, I, yeah. Because I wrote them all did. up, and then I couldn't remember if Thank I sent you. them out. Yeah, I thought I, I thought I saw them, but maybe not. Yeah. Maybe we I'll can see. ask um, John if, to post them If I them sent on them out, I website. sent them out again. It's not a big deal. Okay. Okay. All right. So and August 27th. Whew. Mike, you got all the edits? Right. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I make these back in my office. Great. Barb and Mike could work on a memo to present to City Council. I mean, I don't care. We can leave it that way. That's fine. We will work on it. <coughs> Won't we, Mike? Maybe. Yes. <laughs> oh, nice guy. Maybe that's why it's worded that way. Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, so um, what were we doing with the motion? 
So the motion modifies based on the edits made. So I understand the motion to approve the minutes from January 22nd. Nope, January 22nd is already approved. Okay, right. motion to approve May 14th, 2018, July 9th, 2018, August 13th, 2018, August 27th, 2018, with the edits provided by Barb. And we'll take up July 23rd, 2018 in the next meeting. Um, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? Okay, those minutes are approved. Um, one quick note before we adjourn, Mike, our next meeting would normally be October 8th. Is that a That's holiday? Columbus Day. Okay. So what would folks like to do? Would you like me to, to try to reschedule for a ninth, or are we pushing to the 22nd for the next meeting? That's when the council acts um, when the terms start uh, it's October 1 how does that work? Uh, I mean, some of us may not be I think it was an October appointment I think it's supposed to be an October appointment so did you not apply? it looked like we all applied and there's one other person oh um, I see I, I applied, but I'm reconsidering it because I'll be in Florida for two and a half months. Oh, and I, I said in my application I wouldn't miss that many meetings. <laughs> <laughs> so I need to reconsider that. Is there only... It was just one other person. One other person. Yeah. Well, well, why don't we plan to skip the 8th? That'll give you some yeah. room it, to it, think it is about. It's not the only one seat anyhow. It'll give me a little bit of time to put together the landscaping yeah. recommendation. So if I get that early, I'll try to get that out to folks so you get a chance at home to okay. chew on it a little bit. But you've heard a little bit of the reasoning and what the problems were. So, so many problems. Many no meeting on October 8th. The next meeting will be October 22nd. Same, same time, same place. And uh, we're going to be tackling the landscaping issue. And then also the slope. And we'll by that point, I mean, I will send out the information on the slope, okay. right. including the memo after Mike has a chance yeah. to look at it. I mean, if we have resolutions to those two issues, we can send both of those to council for consideration. Yeah, and the signs. Because it's, oh, and not, the signs. Nece it's not necessarily yeah, the buildable area part of the regulation. That's a problem, but it's not as much of a problem as the 30%, the outright 30% prohibition as applications come in. That's another one that the DRB has issues on. If we could fix that, which I think we have a relatively quick fix, that would work. Oh, I thought it was the other way around. I thought it was the uh, exclusion of the land, the, the buildable area. Both of them are a problem. Uh -huh. but this is why the memo is going to be yeah, such good. The, both of them are both of them are problems, <laughs> which is why I recommended changing both of them. But I think the the one that the outright prohibition of thirty percent slopes. We just have a lot of applications that come in for somebody wants to fix a retaining wall, and they're not allowed to. So we're just like, well, that just doesn't make any sense because a retaining wall creates a 30% slope. Yeah, yeah, I just, I guess, so we, but that's a repair as opposed to a new, new development. So but I guess to dig it out repair. to build a new one is affecting the steep slope. So we basically, we just need to get that exception in, and they've got an engineer. So the, the DRB has put their input in that they like kind of how we're doing it with an requiring an engineer. If you're affecting it, you got to have an engineer. And I think the recommendations we made to switch the table helps a lot too. It makes a lot more sense. But one of, yeah, and one of my points about the tables is that you know we need to be able to determine what the percent of slope is to apply those tables. So some there must be a way to apply. I mean, to, to determine the percent of slope because yes. that's what those tables are based on. 
Okay. All right. So I need a final motion to adjourn. So we'll make it. Who wants it? I'll, I'll take it. Then Kim, you want a second? Kim gets the second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay. We are adjourned. Thanks, everybody.